each right says, the sky is falling. The U.S. dropped by almost half. We're nowhere near where we should be in car sales. An unimaginable two billion bucks a month. Their last line of defense is being used. We're not going to put a target in terms of when we can turn a profit. No, no Americans, we're we're talking, we're 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 Americans are through buying sure. cars right now. We're at multi-decade lows. We've got a problem with cars, and I'm here to talk to you about one solution to uh, help us get rid of that problem, and I just want to say that it is an honor to follow the two gentlemen in front of me and everybody else that's spoken at PopTech, because it's a challenge that we all can uh, ride into together in a successful automobile, and I think that the general collective intelligence here is on the right track, so that's the good news. The other piece of good news is I just wanted to say that it was a uh, pleasure for me personally to be able to be here because when I was contacted by PopTech, they said, we're going to do this conference, and I said, that's great, and they said, but it's a little bit of a distant place away, and I said, where is it? I said, I'm happy to come to China if that's where you're going to do it, and they said, no, 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 it's actually New England. I was said, oh, great, I'm in New England. That's awesome. And they said, well, but it's not that close. I mean, it's not in Boston. You've got to go to Maine, and I was like, ooh, Maine, that's pretty far, um, and so... But then they said, Maine, they said Camden. I was like, Camden? That's 15 minutes from my house. <laughs> so I just want to say that it would not be without, uh, um, it wouldn't be the same conference if it wasn't for the fact that my mother had showed up today to see me talk. So <laughs> she's back there. Hi, Mom. Here's the problem that we have with automotive, and we've seen it with Nike today. They talked about, I mean, yesterday, they've talked about it also. We saw it in Braddock, Pennsylvania with U.S. Steel. We have a problem in this country with frictional unemployment. This is the Nissan Smyrna plant. It's one of the more advanced automotive plants that we have in this country. It's in Tennessee, and it's 5.2 million square feet. It's a big mother. And it can make 500,000 cars a year, but it doesn't right now because you're not buying them. And they wish you would buy them. But the problem is that you don't want them that much because they're really not that interesting. They don't have the latest technology. They don't use water to power the car. They don't use distributed electricity to power the car. And we all have the internet to know that there's a better way to do things. So that 500,000 a year, very flexible, extremely powerful plant that really can't make less than 50 or 60,000 of a type of car is going to turn out looking like, looking like something that we're pretty familiar with. And that thing that we're pretty familiar with is uh, this. Right now, we've got a, uh, a, a uh, unemployment rate in Detroit or in Flint, Michigan of, does anybody know what it is today? 20, 23? Did I hear 23? It's, it's high. Boston is at 8%. So if you woke up in Boston the, the net tomorrow and it was at 23% unemployment, you would want to start a riot. But people in Michigan have been living with this riot-type condition, and in Braddock, Pennsylvania, and other places like that, because it's the way that we've sort of learned to deal with frictional unemployment. It's, boy, we've been reeling in Pittsburgh since U.S. Steel shut down. Well, U.S. Steel shut down a long time ago. So we've got to deal with this issue of frictional unemployment unless we want to have Smyrna, Tennessee look like this, unless we want to have SAIC and the GM plant that produces cars in China look like this. So we have a solution. We have another way to talk about it. And that's what Local Motors is. In uh, 1999, I joined the US Marines, and I was dropped into Iraq for my second deployment in my first time in a war zone. And I was scared stiff. There's another word for it, but we won't use it when my mother's here. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so I was really scared. And the bottom line was I was learning right away what, what a challenge for uh, you know, the breaking of a man, if you will. And when I came into that situation, I met a guy, his name was Safa. I've shared this story for a number of people. I have so many stories about my time as a Marine. But, but Safa's a really interesting one because he worked at the camp where I spent my nights. And that camp was a lonely place, but it was made better by the fact that we had lots of people from Iraq that would come in and they would join with us. We were in the Shia area of the country and Safa came in every day and he worked. He unloaded boxes, he cut hair, we made friends, we cut ditches together, it was a good thing. One day when he came to work, he came in with three women. And those three women were shot in the face on the way in, killed. 
and they said, this is what's going to happen to your family. Now, here was a French-educated, well-to-do man in his head, but very poor because he had been repressed as a Marsh Arab. We know what had happened in Iraq. And so he had a choice to make. His choice was, do, do I come to work? Do, does my family get put down? Because they've told me if I do help this British unit, I was attached to a British multinational unit. That's what's going to happen to me. So he had a choice, and he made that choice. And he came to work the next day. He made a commitment. And the commitment was to promise something better for his family. And we see this across the world, people making choices. And so we have to make a choice individually. We've all been burdened with this idea of trying to do something different. And the choice is we've got to become more connected, more connected with our vehicles, more connected with the life that we lead around. And we've got to make a difference in how we can approach the automotive solution. So moving forward. Go over here. This is going kind of slow for me. We've all heard, and I don't need to touch this again, uh, cars and light trucks use 71% of US oil end use, domestic and imported. Cars are the biggest use, user of uh, petroleum. And that's a significant issue. My grandfather was a great mentor to me. This guy, he, he, he was a giant in my life, and albeit I would wager a giant in your life too. He, if any of you have ever watched public television, this man co-founded public television. Um, it would be hard for me to live up to his legacy, but one thing that he actually shared with me was that he loved cars. He was the first person to ever put a diesel engine in a car, and he believed that this was the right way to go, and he didn't do it by joining GM. He did it because he was uh, passionate about cars, and he ran a diesel engine business, the Cummins Diesel Engine Company for the East Coast. He was the distributor. So he took that engine out, and he put it in a 1935 Auburn, and he made a car that was 30% more fuel efficient just based on the fuel of diesel versus gasoline. He was a doer. He crowdsourced the cure for rheumatic fever. He had rheumatic fever, so he got really interested in it. And so he went ahead and he said, I'm going to raise money and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to fund scientists that are going to help a cure for the disease that I have that I share with so many other people. And probably one of the most important things that he did is he owned the Indian Motorcycle Company. Any motorheads out there? Yeah. Woo! Right on. Right there. All right. Have you ever driven an Indian? Yes. Awesome. What year? Okay, so he owned it in 1944, 44 to about 54, and then he shut it down. And the reason why he shut it down is because he couldn't make money doing it. And the reason why he couldn't make money doing it is because he had to build his own engines. There was nobody that was providing him brakes, engines, other things like that. And so it was a very inefficient business for him to run. So he went off and he did a bunch of other things. And so in, in the wake of the financial disaster of the Indian Motorcycle Company, he started another company. And one of the things he did during that time was he created this newsletter called the Rogers Roundup. This was blogging. 2.0. This is like blogging 0.05. But, but it is exactly what we do right now. He was writing letters. He had an expense line on the company P&L that was just four editors out there writing letters to the front line saying, what can Rogers Diesel and Aircraft do for you? And then how can we make things better? He ran polls. He took suggestions. He did other things like that. I mean, we were doing 2.0 long before. And he left me with this. Everybody knows who Preston Tucker is. I just got stunted. I stopped when it came to cars. I'd come home on a Sunday and I'd be like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to build something in the backyard. It's going to have wheels four because it's more stable and I'm going to make cars. And that was my love. And we know Mal Malcolm and uh, Malcolm Bricklin, Powell and Lewis Crosley, John DeLorean, all these famous names that get shot back at me in our social media day. You know, do you know how stupid you are for starting a car company? All those names. So Preston Tucker is sort of one of those things that my grandfather threw in my direction. And the thing that we need to evolve to is the fact that we have this sort of power right now to have a little glass of water that we break. Because we all know that if you invest in basic science or you invest in basic home building or you invest in basic work, that you can actually do a lot. You can make beautiful art. You can make great solutions for solving uh, um, distributed SMS uh, um, communication uh, issues or gridlock in providing healthcare in uh, developing nations. And we can do a lot with building our own home. Paula Dean and Bobby Flay show it to us all the time. How can you make a gourmet meal? We are a do-it-yourself generation. And the thing that is nice about that is that can apply to cars. So I challenge everybody 
to get a little bit more connected with your car and don't take that first knee-jerk reaction to whip out a check and go to Toyota and say, I want to buy a Prius because it's the most efficient thing on the road because it's not the most efficient thing on the road. It, as a process, is an incredibly inefficient machine. And if there's anybody here from Toyota, I think you probably would agree with me. It's just the, as Winston Churchill once said, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. You know, the Prius may be the least efficient car except for all the others. The issue is the process is broken because we have a very, very stretched uh, chain where when new technology is developed by all these great companies that are funded by Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia and all those venture capitalists that we all know, the car companies don't want to buy that technology because then they'd have to put it in all their dealerships. But guess what? They don't own the dealerships. Dealerships could give a hoot what the car company does because they have to fund the money to fix it. And that's all the problem that we've seen in the infighting that's gone on. So if you could make cars locally, if you could put them together with the manufacturing, sales, and service together, you might have a chain that could actually do something about this. So my challenge to everybody is, if we loved cars enough, if we made them really exciting, then you could have people want to buy them. And really exciting means a sexy body shape, a great piece of technology in it, a lightweight car that makes you really excited, the kind of thing that you leave your window shade up at night so you say, hey, I want to look at that car because that's the coolest thing out there. And cool can be defined in so many different ways. But if you shove somebody's head in a car and you say, buy this car, the chances they're going to want to do it, whether it's an incentive or a little yellow sticker that they get to put in to go in an HOV lane or other things like that, is much less. It's not none, but it's much less than if you made it something that they deeply desired. And we don't all desire the same thing. So how can we scale down, make cars locally, and make them something that is really exciting? This is my challenge. Make them cool. Make you want them. Stop our administration, any one of them, whether they're blue or red, from giving us incentives to want to go. You might know what my feeling is about cash for, cash for clunkers. So make cool cars. Cool to us, it's an acronym. It's been a word that's been overused and underused. You know, the way I like to think about it is South Beach, Miami was cool. It was cool in the 50s. It was cool in the 60s. How many people have been to South Beach? A lot of people, even though we're here in New England, have been to South Beach. So it's a pretty cool place. Art Deco, lots of nice looking people on the beaches, and all that sort of thing. So community is our first thing. We have a community. We have the largest online design and development community of engineers and enthusiasts in the car industry today, and it's happened in 16 months. 16 months, because we tapped into people's passion for making cars. Come to local-motors.com, local but most of you probably just Google or Bing things. And so uh, um, just look up Local Motors. Where's the micro Microsoft group? So uh, just look up Local Motors, and you'll find us. And we have thousands of designers, and we run competition. And competition for us is what breeds the excitement that's out there. We are an open source car company. If you want to come in and learn how we make our chassis, how we make our body, and who did it, and how it all comes together, you can do that at Local Motors. When was the last time that you could go to Toyota and say, could you just send me over the specs on how you put that together? Somebody said to me at MIT and, and the young uh, um, group that's doing a fast recharge battery program said, you know, we're trying to find somebody that can do a battery management system because they're all the same. But there are nine different makers of battery management systems out there and they're all cloistered. They're all, they're all held tight. And we're going to make one and we're just going to put it open source. <gasps> What's that going to do to all those people who have those cloistered battery management systems? Tesla. <clears throat> That's a problem. I don't have any problem with Tesla. I just think that the best plan is to get the car that you feel the most uh, excited about. And if you can avoid spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do it, then you can make a profitable company. And that's the important thing. If we're going to be sustainable, we need to be able to fit within the, uh, the construct of being able to have something that's lasting. OK, so ownership. Car companies always talk to you about ownership. How many people have bought a car that is uh, from a new car salesman today, and they walk in and they say, we're going to give you a great ownership experience? Anybody heard that before? Nobody. OK, maybe it comes in a different package. All right, so the bottom line is they say, we're going to service it well for you. We're going to take care of you. We've got to meet you in a nice suit. The problem is that it really is the same thing across everything. When was the last time that you could go into the dealership and say, I drive a Saab, and the seatbelt cuts me across the clavicle or really hard. Could you just fix that on the next time? Because they'll look at you, and they'll say, you're crazy. We don't make the cars. And so ownership for us is about bringing you in, in Local Motors version, in a micro factory production methodology. You come and make the car with us. 
Now, that's not a very exciting thing for everybody, but it's a very exciting thing for some people. And that's the, the pitch, that's the, the pinnacle of the iceberg where we start. And that is the exciting experience of learning and becoming more connected with your car. For us, it takes two weekends for you to come. And since we're local, which is not surprisingly what the L is, it's easy for you to get there and be part of that. You become a better steward of your car. We don't ask you to cut. We don't ask you to deal with things that are smelly. We just ask you to learn about it for two weekends. And since we're local, we'll be within a couple hour drive of where you live. It could be a great experience. Come with your kids. Come with your spouse. Come with your friends and learn something about cars. This is our community. This is just a small spat smattering of what they do. We run competitions and we'll spec an area. Local Motors has figured out how to make specific cars that really are exciting to people because we don't do it ourselves from a top-down siloed perspective. We go out and we ask, what is something that you would like? So you can see in the upper right-hand corner, if you're imagining a car for Southern California, or if you see in the bottom right-hand, the upper left-hand corner, bottom right-hand corner, you've got a car for Detroit reimagined. And so we go through and we run these things maybe every three weeks, every month, sometimes every week, and we've stretched it even further than design. Now we run engineering competitions. We run interior design competitions. We run parts for the whole car. We run parts for the little car. This is our first car. It's called the Rally Fighter. It's a performance desert racing authentic experience from the build to the use. This thing can race the Bureau of Land Management lands, and it can go over 20-inch uh, potholes. It's got huge potential. And what we found is I, I wasn't a particular lover of desert racing vehicles. The bottom line was that it was a niche that wasn't being served. We make this car 3,200 pounds. It's less than a BMW 3 Series in weight. But it's got an engine that has 425 pound-feet of torque for ye gearheads who like to go really fast. And it's been specced so that it can use a dual fuel engine. It could use an electric engine. The bottom line is we make cars. And you will learn how to make cars with us. We can put in lightweight materials as they come online. There are nine engine companies right now, nine engine companies right now, that want to come and put their new power plant here with us. So you could park the Tesla outside of your house, and that could use a fuel cell to power with electricity overnight. Or you could park a hydrogen engine car, and instead of putting the energy through the fuel cell, just put it directly into the car. Pick your poison as it comes out. But power plants, unlike in my grandfather's day of Indian, have become much more distributed. And there's an ability for us to advance if we could speed the process of making the car. So the Rally Fighter, we did it. We went out, we crowdsourced the design, and we said, we're going to build this sucker in 18 months. The average car program today takes five years. Five years. We did it in 18 months. The average car program takes $200 million. We did it for $1,350,000. It's not no money. It does take some money to do, but that's like 100 times less. So we use technology that wasn't available before in order to be able to scan parts that are already out there. We don't make engines. We don't make brakes. We need to be able to put them in. And we integrate them into our car. And the final result is that we can make cars five times faster. We can make them 100 times less capital intensive. And the end result is a sexy car that's meaningful to a niche population. And we can niche it out like all day long. Here's what we do. San Francisco, you want to drive your own jet fighter. You don't want to be a minivan that's boring. You want to have something that's a really sweet electric looking car that's like a Grand Prix. You want to have something that's like you never seen it before. It'd be great in the Olympics. <laughs> you want to have some really sexy conservative car of the future that's totally futuristic. You want to do something that's just got the old feel but kind of moves forward a little bit more. Something that's a little bit more like an X-Terra meets a Subaru Baja. Or you like Project Better Place. You want to have a vehicle like this. Join our vision at Local Motors. Come check us out on the web and come visit one of our micro factories. I challenge you to make cool cars. Thank you.